is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. College athletes aren't really aware or weren't aware of what the expectations. Most of them knew that it was going to be work and you had to learn how to manage your time and you know you had to be academically prepared. But I think the bigger picture is there were just so many things that as athletes we wish we would have known. And the thing that I'm realizing is for me that was 30, 35 years ago, but nothing's changed. Tim Jackson is the author of the new book, Understanding College Athletics Through the Eyes of College Athletes. Tim was inducted into the Youngstown State Hall of Fame after starting all 112 games in his four-year career with the YSU men's basketball program from 1987 to 1991. He is one of just four players in school history with more than 1,000 points and at least 800 rebounds. At Youngstown State, he averaged 13.7 points per game during his career and hauled down 810 career rebounds while averaging eight per game. He's currently ranked in the top 10 all-time at Youngstown State in career minutes, career games started, rebounds, field goal percentage, and fouls. He's the number 12 all-time leading scorer. Jackson graduated from Youngstown State with a degree in elementary education. While in high school at Canton McKinley, he scored 1,032 points and had 650 rebounds and is currently the seventh all-time leading scorer for the Bulldogs. Tim is currently a middle school teacher at Norfolk Public Schools in Virginia after stops in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. In addition, he is a high school and college football official as well as a high school basketball referee. Hey, Hoopheads, I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. This is Dan Evans, head men's basketball coach at the University of North Georgia, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to check out the Hoopheads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Coaches, do you have a point guard or leader you're going to be counting on next season to run the show for you? Don't leave next season to chance. Thousands of coaches send their players to a point guard college camp each summer to learn to think the game, lead a team, and run the show. Your players will be smarter, better leaders, and better equipped to foster a championship culture next season in practice and in your locker room. I've seen firsthand how PGC camps have had a huge impact on players and coaches that I know, both on and off the court. You can go to pgcbasketball.com to find a five-day, four-night camp near you. That's pgcbasketball.com. Have a notebook handy as you listen to this episode with Tim Jackson author of the new book, Understanding College Athletics Through the Eyes of College Athletes. 
Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to be joined by Tim Jackson, the author of the brand new book, Understanding College Athletics Through the Eyes of College Athletes. Tim, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Mike, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Excited to have you on. I think that your book has tremendous value for any high school athlete who is thinking about participating in college athletics. There's a ton of great stories and information that I think anybody who's going to become a college athlete can benefit from the experience of, of from people who have already gone through and experienced what they're about to experience. So give us the quick elevator pitch for the book. First of all, maybe the why behind it, and then just summarize in your own words why this book is so valuable, why you wanted to put it together, and why you wanted to get it out there to people. Yeah, no question. So the why the, the the entire idea came from I officiate I officiate college football, and I was working a football uh, practice, and uh, I asked the kid. I said, "Is this what you thought it was going to be?" And he's like, "No, I thought it was going to be fun." It's like, <laughs> wow, no one no one told you. So then I'm I'm working uh, Arizona State uh, uh, scrimmage, and there's a kid who's hurt, and he's you know on the sideline, and I'm, so I, I, I asked him, I said, again, is this what you thought it was going to be? Did you realize once you got hurt that you kind of no longer matter? He says, he starts, he kind of chuckles and he says, man, that is exact. He's like, I'm invisible. No one sees me. No one knows me. So the, the, the point came that, you know, college athletes aren't really aware or weren't aware of what the expectations. Most of them knew that it was going to be work and that it was a lot of, you know, a lot of time and you had to learn how to manage your time and, you know, you had to be academically prepared. But I think the bigger picture is there were just so many things that, you know, as athletes, we wish we had known. And the thing that I'm realizing is, you know, for me, that was 30, 35 years ago, but nothing's changed. You know, all these things that, um, athletes go through high school athletes have no idea, you know, they get some of the pieces, but in general, there's really no knowledge of truly what takes place. So I wanted to get that information out. So that's, that's the, that's the why. You are a hundred percent right that I think high school athletes and parents and families have really no idea what they're getting into. And I think you said it very well, thinking about back in the time when you played college basketball, same era as me. And I'm curious to kind of dive into your experiences, what those were like compared to what my experiences were like. And then we can relate that to what the college experience is like for kids today. So let's go back in time to when you were a kid. Talk about some of your first experiences with the game of basketball, how you got introduced to the game, and just what are some of your earliest memories? Well, it's so funny. I, I had recently just uh, spoke to athletes at McKinley, where I went to high school, Kent McKinley, and uh, I was sort of reminiscing. And, and I there are memories that I kind of forgotten about. <laughs> um, you know, when I when I actually the first year I ever played. Um, I, I totally forgot about because one of the kids is, you know, how, how did you get started? Well, I was in the sixth grade. I was, I, I grew up, you know, Northeast Ohio football, football is love. And, you know, basketball was just something to do. And I'm like, I'm a football player. I'm not playing basketball, but all my te all my friends were on, on our elementary school team. And at that time, all the elementary schools in Canton, there was a league, and we all played each other. And uh, the coach came to the playground. You know, I was probably in the sixth grade. I was probably about six foot tall. And he's, you know, salivating, thinking, oh, this kid needs to be playing basketball. And again, I'm a football player. I don't, you know, I'm not playing basketball. So he convinced me to play. And uh, fast forward, we actually won the championship. And I hit the game-winning shot. It was actually it was a sky hook, by the way. Nice old school Kareem Abdul-Jabbar <laughs> sky hook. Um, and we beat a uh, pretty, you know, pretty legendary team that had some 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 solid names, uh, you know, throughout the history of Canton basketball. And um, 
you know, it, it started my actual love for the game. You know, it's, it's, I think it's like that storybook beginning of, you know, guy plays a sport that he's never played before, organized, wins a championship, hits the game winning shot, is, wins the, uh, MVP of the, of the team, MVP of the league. And then, you know, move on to junior high and two years, we didn't lose a game. Uh, and then I get to McKinley and, you know, McKinley, it's, I, I've, I've had this conversation so many times about the history of Camp McKinley basketball. And, um, I, one of the people in the book, Andre Brown, who was a teammate of mine from Youngstown, he, I think he, he's just so sick of hearing Camp McKinley, Camp McKinley, Camp McKinley. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we, we have a pride and it's, you know, it's, it's a storied program. And, you know, for me, just to be a part of it was, was tremendous. It was, you know, you, you grow up in Canton, you hear the stories of the legends of, you know, Phil Hubbard and Troy and Ro- Troy Taylor, Ronnie Stokes, Gary Grant, you know, and it, it's just, just so many people. And you just, you just, your goal is to just be mentioned, to live, you know, following those footsteps and just, you know, be mentioned in the same breath as some of those people. So, you know, being able to play in the field house is oh, nice. <laughs> have, so I'm, I'm assuming you played in the field house. I've, I have only, I did not ever play a game in the field house, but I coached a game in the field okay. house and I've been to many games in the field you house, know, but for people, for people who aren't aware, it's just, it's just a great, it's, it's an unbelievable venue it's an old school old arena you know and the, the weird thing is i have no idea how many people it holds you know i've, I've heard ten thousand. i've heard six thousand. i know it's thousands but i have no idea and you know there were there were nights where um there were so many people in the building that the floor the condensation from the you know it's cold outside and then there's, it's just so warm inside. And I remember once we played, we were playing Temkin and they had, you know, a really, really good team. And it was Valentine's Day. And it was just, it felt like we were playing on ice because there was just so much condensation on the floor. And I think, I want to say there were about 8,000 people in the building that night. But it's, it's, it's an amazing place. But, the funny thing is, it's my third favorite place to play in terms of high school basketball. My number one place was always Jar Arena. I always had love playing in, in whenever we would play Central Howard, we would play at the Jar. And so when I got to Youngstown and we played against Akron, you know, I still had some of my best games in that arena. And then my second favorite place would be the Civic Center, downtown Canton. Because they had the they had the floor, you know the the uh, movable removable right, yeah, floor, yeah. and the it spring, just a little it springy, had the springs. Nice and springy, yeah, oh yeah. my god! So yeah, I had nice some of my some of my best dunks, some of my best games played there. But that yeah, almost got me where I could touch the net <laughs> when I had that when I had that nice springy floor. I could probably uh, get I could probably get up. I might have been able to touch the rim. So yeah, we had some legendary uh, like I remember playing Barbara in there. Uh, we played um, Warren. Uh, Oh, the old Warren Western Reserve team that all these schools that no longer exist. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you go back and you look at the high school basketball landscape now and trying to recognize what league teams are in and this and that. It's funny because I was out on high school basketball for a little while after I got done coaching and I was kind of in the weeds with my own kids as they were young. And now my son is uh, finishing up his sophomore year of high school now. And so it's kind of gotten me back into – high school basketball and getting a chance to see guys. And then I'm, I'm watching kids that he kind of grew up playing against and like, Oh yeah, I know that kid from here. Right. I know that kid from there. Whereas for a long time I was kind of out of that mix. So it's fun to be able to go back and start going to games again and kind of knowing, knowing some players and going to some of these places to watch games. It's, it's a lot of fun again. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, again, growing up in a football state, we sometimes lose track of how great the basketball was and still is. You know, I, I don't have a, a true following of Ohio basketball, 
but you know, it, just picking up a newspaper, or, you know, every once in a while, you know, Plain Dealer, or the Repository, or Akron Beacon Journal, and seeing, okay, yeah, some of these, some of some of the teams are still, you know, legendary teams, and some of them, you know, they're not what they used to be, but there's there's always going to be talent in Ohio. There's always. And the state of Ohio has so many colleges. When you think about the number of Division One schools in the state of Ohio, and then you think about the number of Division Three schools in the state of Ohio, the opportunity to play college basketball, if you are an Ohio high school basketball player and you have that kind of ability, there's plenty of places that you can go right here in the state of Ohio to no be able question. to play to play your college basketball. So talk a little bit about your experience and your decision to go to Youngstown State. What was your recruitment like? <laughs> It's a it's a very interesting story because, for the most part, I was recruited mainly by Ohio University, Eastern Michigan, uh, Bowling Green was in the mix. Um, actually, uh, Kent was in the mix for a little bit, um, and I, I think I had narrowed my choices down to either Ohio University, Bowling Green, or Eastern. And so we had just uh, completed our state championship run and a guy named Bill Daly, who was coach at Youngstown, he was the assistant coach and he had just gotten the head job. And his assistant was David Greer. David Greer is a McKinley guy. I played for him, you know, as a kid in summer league. I know, I know his family very well, known him, you know, majority of my life. So he took a assistant job at Youngstown and this was his actual recruiting pitch. Timmy, we're, t we're driving up to Youngstown to go watch a basketball game, and then you're going to commit to Youngstown. <laughs> so I'm like, Dave, that's that's your actual pitch? He's like, yeah, I already talked to your parents. You're, you're good. You're coming to Youngstown. <laughs> I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> All you right. Know, that it, decision, this decision was made above your pay grade, apparently. Completely. And the, the, the funny thing is I knew nothing about Youngstown. I had you know, been there a few times. You know, We played uh, a couple schools. We played Boardman. We played, uh, who do we play? Uh, Youngstown South. And then our football team had played Mooney. So we went up to watch, uh, the Mooney game. It was actually played at, at, uh, Stanball Stadium at YSU. And, you know, junior high, we played in a tournament in Poland, Poland, Ohio, which is, you know, suburb of Youngstown. But I, I, I knew nothing. Youngstown was not even in the picture in terms of recruitment. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a school that was on my radar whatsoever. And that's where I just, you know, David Greer said, you're coming. So I, I went. <laughs> um, so it's probably one of the weirdest recruiting stories because as far as I know, I don't know, you know, I've heard stories of people who, you know, who chose a college without actually visiting, you know, kind of like the Maurice Claret situation where he like, oh, I'm going to Ohio State. But, you know, it's, it was, I, I'm a true believer that things, everything happens for a reason and it was the right place for me. Um, it was a struggle because, you know, coming from, you know, we were 25 and three my senior year at McKinley. Uh, I thought we had our best season, um, the previous year and we lost to, uh, Akron Central Howard, Eric Glenn. Uh, we beat them regular season and, and I can't remember how many, by how many points we beat them, but I knew we were a better team than, and they ended up winning the state championship that year. You know, funny, how, funny, funny how that happens, right? Exactly. Where you, feel, where you feel like your team is, you feel like your team is, is, is the better team and it doesn't, unfortunately, sometimes you only get one crack at it. You know, it, with McKinley being, and I don't know if you know this, but McKinley is the winningest basketball program in the state of Ohio. And the hardest thing to swallow is, I think we only have three state championships. And if I remember correctly, I think we have eight runner up. So, you know, I, there's, there's historically has always been so much talent and, you know, the, the team that won the 84 state championship, you know, Gary Grant, Anthony Robinson, Dale Jackson, that team was, you know, it was a loaded team. But if you, if you ask anyone from Canton, Hey, is that the best team to ever McKinley ever fielded? Oh, no, no, no. There are teams that, you know, this thing, Phil Hubbard never won a state championship. Nick Weatherspoon never won a state championship. 
Eric Snow never won a state championship. You know, when you think about, you know, the great players that come out of McKinley and the great teams, you know, that team, uh, what year was that? That would have been uh, 1992, I think. They had four Division I starters on the, on the basketball team. You know, and two of them went on to play NBA. And I, you know, I think they lost to Jackson, you know, the Jamie Bosley team, which is, you know, a really good team. But when you look at, again, McKinley, it's like we had some teams that were just so good, but just could not, for whatever reason, win a state championship. But anyway, you know, moving on to Youngstown, for me, having, you know, the, you know, we, we, we prided ourselves at McKinley in, in playing tough, hard-nosed basketball. We were, you know, a defensive school. Um, you know, teams, most of the teams thought we just rolled the basketballs out and just, you know, just showed up. But, you know, our conditioning program was, you know, I think second to none for high school. Um, I, I remember the days of just watching our f- coach's finger point from inline to inline. We were just <laughs> running sprints, you know. Uh, my first coach was Mike Riley, and I, I truly remember not touching a basketball until October. And all we did was defensive stance and defensive slides. You had to sit in a defensive stance, and if you moved, he would start the count over. And then we would, you know, with our high school being next to the Hall of Fame, that the, it used to be a hill. We would run the hill, and then we would go down to the to the baseball field and just do sprints. And that's you know, we never touched the basketball. And, you know, that was, that was the mentality that we had is, you know, we're, we're going to be in better shape than you in the fourth quarter if, if we get to there. And I think, you know, the other thing is every team we play, I think we were their biggest game of the year. And when, when you have teams come into the field house or when we go to them and, you know, you have to, you can't take a night off. You know, regardless of who you're playing, because if they're going to play their best basketball, you know, that makes you have to step it up. So by the time I got to Youngstown, it was like, okay, I, I know how to work. You know, I, I, I understand the concepts of defense, you know, but college basketball, regardless, is, is a lot more difficult. So, you know, just we had the terminology. We understood, you know, the defenses and we understood uh, how to defend Pretty much any, whether it's a zone, whether it's a man, you know, we, we we understood the fact that if if you can't play man, you can't you can't play zone. And there's so many players, you know, who get to college and all they do is play zone and they they can't match up and they can't defend. You know, uh, one of the things I constantly remember is my coach and after Bill Daly died, Jim Clemens. Oh, I didn't even mention that. So I get to Young Sound. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, but I get to Young Sound and the coach who recruited me. He dies. He dies of cancer. So then, you know, Dave Greer's still there, but then they bring in Jim Clemens, who was an assistant coach at Ohio State, who played for Ohio State. Um, you know, he's, I think he was a Columbus East guy. He always talked about his 1972 state championship or whatever. <laughs> he's, he rubbed that in our face. Oh, you, you know, I won a state championship. <laughs> like, coach, you, you didn't win a national championship. So, you know, that's okay. But anyway, um, Fast forwarding, you know, just he would constantly. The thing that bothered him the most is when you get beat baseline. I'm gonna not, you do not let your man beat you baseline. Yeah, that's like embedded in my head. But it, you know, again, you, you, you coming hear out, of, hear that in your sleep, right? I hear, I you know, again, thirty thirty odd years later, I still yeah. hear that. But you know, coming it. out of McKinley, you know, it was we knew how to 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 slide to to cut off baseline we we constantly trapped and we you know that was the pl- the way we played basketball so the transition for me to college the physical was fine the academic was fine it was the mental and the emotional that i had to learn to deal with what did that look like so for you when you say mental and emotional what what parts of it the mental and emotional from the pressure being put on you by the coaching staff by playing like psychological the, the tricks psych- and games. The psychological games. And yep. I think, you know, it, yep. again, 
I remember coaches, you know, you had to run the, the suicide in, you know, let's just say 25 seconds. You know, nope, you didn't make it back on the line. And then you look over and you realize this guy doesn't even have a watch on. Right. They're not even watching. Exactly. Look, look, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's the, you know, you're tired, you're emotionally drained, you're physically drained, and you still have to get up for practice or you still have to get up for a game. And, you know, um, the the transition from high school to college is 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 it's for some people it's it's you know physically again for me physically it wasn't an issue so the mental and the emotional was just dealing with the mind games dealing with the fact that you had to learn how to manage your time you know the thing you know and I talk about it a lot in the book but the thing that um, in high school you have school all day. And then you go to practice and then the rest of the day, you know, whatever your, your mom makes you dinner and you have this, you know, this, this really routine life. Now you get to, you get to college and all right, you don't have the same guards. You don't have the same um, responsibilities in terms of parents waking you up or you don't have that. Um, if you have a 5 a.m. practice or 6 a.m. practice and you're up at 5 a.m. and then you're, you know, you're trying to rush to class after you shower and then you, you know, you, you just learned, you don't have, you have so much more freedom and you have so much more free time, but you were never taught how to manage it. So the, the, that, that process of learning how to, to manage your time, learn how to deal with things. Number one, when you're just tired, you know, because you don't know how to manage your time, you don't realize you have to go to bed a lot earlier because you have to get up early. But you're so used to, you know, the regimen of, well, I'm going to hang out and talk to my friends or I'm going to, you know, play video games or I'm going to do whatever. And it's like, you know, that 5 a.m. alarm is a lot, <laughs> goes off a whole That's lot That's coming faster. quick. <laughs> so, you, you know, you, you really learn, even though you have so much more free time in college, you, you have to learn how to manage the time. How do you think about when you look back at your high school career versus your college career and you think about the, the fun factor or the enjoyment factor between the two, when you think about high school versus college, how do you, how do you think about that? retrospectively you know it's i think playing at mckinley was so much fun and there was you know, there's pressure but it's not the same pressure and and, the, and conversely youngstown there wasn't the same amount of pressure so you know a program like mckinley we had you know we had more fans we had more pressure we had you know it was we won and, you know, when you're winning, it's a whole lot, you know, your food tastes better, your girlfriend looks better. Everything is just so much better when you win, you know, and then getting to Youngstown, 7-21, and 5-23, and 23, first two seasons. And I'm like, this is, this is horrible. This is not fun whatsoever. And I think, you know, I, the fun portion is, it, it partially it is wrapped around with winning, but because it's just, it's, College athletics is a job. And I think if I had no idea, I never looked at basketball as a job. I always looked at it as, you know, it's a sport. It's fun. You play, you play a sport for fun. You, you know, your goal is to win, but it's fun. Well, now you're a scholarship athlete and it's really a job. And, you know, as any other job, it's, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day of, of you know, workouts, lifting, stretching, you know, um, uh, training, um, you know, icing, all these things that, you know, that you didn't do in high school because you just showed up for practice. You know, you put the work in, but your whole day wasn't your sport. Now, college, you have to divide that time between your academic day and and then learning to figure out, okay, how to navigate all these responsibilities that I have. So I had no, that's what, I did not have any idea that it was going to be like that. So, you know, you, you, you take the losing aspect of it. For me, that, that was demoralizing. You know, it, it, 
I think I, I, I did have a goal of playing professionally and I played a little bit when I was done, but I think all that losing just took the love out of the game for me. I mean, I, I enjoyed the game and, you know, looking back now, I appreciate the game more than I love the game. But coming up from going from high school to college, that, you know, the love and just, you know, the, the best part about basketball, and I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this is the relationships, you know, your teammates, you know, the, 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 the road trips, the, you know, some of those things were, were really enjoyable. And, you know, we, we spoke earlier about Reggie Kemp, but I have a, I have a, a really interesting Reggie Kemp story. We were playing, I want to say we were, we were somewhere in the South. I can't remember where. And we started, it started with an honest, little simple water balloon fight. You know, it, it, someone, somehow we got water balloons <laughs> after practice, after our shoot around. And then it went to the hotel. We're throwing out, out the window. And then knowing you, you've seen this in Reggie where he just snaps. So it goes from water balloons to this guy is throwing buckets of water. He filled up his bathtub in a hotel and he's just throwing buckets of water on people. So you start off with this little innocent water balloon fight too. Now we have a bill that we have to pay for the hotel, a cleaning bill that our entire team has to pitch in and play, pay for all this water. Cause he just went nuts and flooded the hotel. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. But that's I mean, like yeah. you, those, those stories, you know, those are the fun parts, you know, the, the road trips and the meals and, and just hanging out and just doing silly fun things together as a team. Um, you know, there's a whole lot more road trips and a lot more time spent traveling in college than high school. So you have, you know, just so much more time to, to get to know your teammates and, 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 that camaraderie that you build, you know, I'm sure you, I know for sure you still have college teammates to this day that you, you know, that you're still hanging out with, or you still call yeah. up and, and remedy and you, and you find yourself quoting things that coaches say. <laughs> just <laughs> absolutely. That's, I think that's, I think one of the funniest parts of the whole thing is any, any player, if you played on a team with a coach for, any length of time you always have you pick up on the things that the sayings that the coach says over and over and over <laughs> again and you just go you go you go back to those and you and everybody had one teammate that was the best at imitating yes said yes. coach down to yes. the manner down to the mannerisms and the look and the you know the whole everything and i think when when you talk about when you talk about fun you know those are definitely those are definitely things that are that are fun. So I'll tell you a good Eric Glenn story. So we were this was I think must have been my must have been my sophomore year. And we would on Saturdays in the preseason, we would do an inner squad scrimmage. And and then you know, you whatever we'd have like a I don't know, forty five minute hour practice and we'd do this inner squad scrimmage. And at some point coach got mad, we went up into the locker room and he took Eric's stool, everybody had a stool with their name on it in front of right, the locker right. and Eric and coach picked up the stool and he fired Eric's stool against the wall because he was mad. He was always <laughs> mad at Eric about his about Eric's weight. So he Eric's weight and he I still remember he would always we'd have to weigh in before and after practice. And one time he said to Eric, he's like, You're killing me with that two eleven, Eric. You're just you're killing me with that two eleven. And so Eric was just kind of always it felt like he was always kind of on Coach was he was he was kind of coach's whipping boy. He uh, yeah, coach always yeah. kind of like, I think because he knew Eric could take it probably. Right. But anyway, yep. so he broke he breaks Eric's stool. So the next day we come in for practice and the players are you know we're getting ready we're in the locker room we're getting dressed and Eric's stool is there but it's in parts you know it's not it's not <laughs> it's it's not put together. So Eric just has the little round top of the part and everybody's like what are you gonna do you know because usually coach comes in and everybody's sitting in the in front of their lockers on their stool. That's just the way, that's just the way we're done. We're like, Eric, what are you going to do, man? Like, what's, what's going to happen here? And he's like, I don't know. What, what should I do? And everybody's like, we think you should just sit, like set the stool, just set that little round wooden piece, just set it right on the floor. 
and sit, you know, and sit on. He's like, oh, I don't know. Coach is going to, you know, what's he going to say? He's going he's to kill me. And so that's what he did. And like, I can still remember sitting in the locker room for, I don't know, it probably was only a minute or two when we all sat down and we knew he was coming in. And just the tension in that room when we were all sitting there going, oh my God, what is he going to do when he walks in and sees Eric sitting on the floor? You know, on this on this little stool, what's going to happen? Is he going to get mad and go crazy again and break someone else's stool? Is he going to think it's funny? It's one of those cases where right. I'm sure you can relate to this. Where you had no idea, you, I, like we had, we literally had no idea. It could have been one of a million outcomes. It could have been anything, and turned out it worked out well because he came in and he looked at Eric and he looked at him again, and then he just kind of started <laughs> laughing and everything and everything was fine. But it could have, it definitely. Depending on his mood, it definitely could have gone a million, a million different directions. We had happening. no so, idea what bipolar was at that time, but I right. think that's a that's a requirement of every college coach is that you have to be bipolar, and you have to if you think your coach is going to be in a good mood, they're it's the opposite. If you think they're in the bad mood and all of a sudden they're happy, um, it, it's it's yeah, that's you just don't know what you're going to get. I I think. Forrest Gump should have said coaches are like a box of chocolate because right. you don't know what you're going to get. That is so true. And I think somebody said it best. Now I can't remember. I wish I could credit who said this on the podcast, but they made a really great point that when you're a high school player and you're playing for your high school coach, and obviously the high school coaches want to win and they're competitive, but at the end of the day, most high school coaches either are a teacher and that's right. how they're paying their bills or they're somebody from outside the school that has – another job. They're not relying on their coaching job to be able to feed their family. And you get to college and you realize there's this whole different level of pressure on coaches. And it's not something that I'm sure you didn't think about it. I didn't think about it when I was a player, but there's a lot of pressure on a college coach that, look, you got to win or you're going to be fired and you're going to lose your job. And then you got to go find some other way to support your family, find another job. And it's the first time that you really in that situation as a player. And I think you describe it really well when you say that it just becomes, it becomes a job. And like, I was a kid who loved basketball and I, there was not one moment in high school that I can ever remember even for one second thinking, man, basketball isn't just the most awesome thing that I've ever done. It was so much fun. Every moment of practice, bus trips, games, like I loved every single second of it. And then you get to college and, my situation, you know, <laughs> unlike you, like I didn't, I didn't play very much as a freshman. I played, you know, I started my last three years, but my freshman year, I played maybe, I don't know, between like probably four and six minutes a game, and there was games where I didn't play at all. And so to go through that grind, and knowing that there was no carrot at the end of that, that you were going to be able to actually get into a game, right? That was some of the most difficult years. And I had two. We had seven freshmen my my freshman year. There were seven scholarship freshmen, and I would live with two of them. And my two my two roommates played even less than me, so I can remember sitting where we would be in the dorm room watching like reruns on Channel Forty Three of the Dick Van Dyke Show would be the show that would ha- that was the show that came on like right at like two thirty or something, and that was when we had to leave for practice. And I remember still like even years later like having PTSD whenever I hear the theme song from <laughs> from, from that from that show. I mean like oh no, it's time we got to go to we got to go to practice now. And I, I mean again like I'm a kid who loved basketball. I still love it, but man, that was the that was the most difficult year of my life. Do you do you remember a player named Steve Ellison? Steve no. played at Perry Ma- no. Maslin. So Steve Steve. I again, I I'd known Steve for a while. Steve went to Air Force Academy, okay. and, and I don't want to put it, he, he passed years ago, but okay. Steve got kicked out of Air Force Academy because <laughs> um, he had a, he had a little problem. So um, he comes to Youngstown, and uh, he's late to practice like three mornings in a row. And he's just, you know, you're late to practice, you have to run. There's there's no other way around it. And sometimes everybody has to run depending on, again, how Correct. coach the feels. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So Steve says, hey, I guarantee you I'm not going to be late tomorrow. He's like, what are you going to do, set your alarm earlier? He's <laughs> like, no, I'm going to sleep outside the stadium. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, again, wintertime, Northeast Ohio. So... 
the next morning I get up and get to practice. He's there. He's dressed. He's already he's already stretching. He's early. Steve, did you sleep outside? I sure did. I got a, a 12 pack of bush, went to sleep right outside. Oh my God. Like, are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Slept all night. Slept well. And when coach came to unlock the door, I was I was here. Wow. That's that's a different kind of commitment. I, I think that's probably the goofiest thing I ever remember, but hey, if it works. That's well, hey, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Right? You got to do what you got to do. If you're going to, if you're going to, but yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I like when I going through your book, and this is something that I'll, I'll you know, I think I, I could totally relate to is you talked about how being on time isn't being on time. Oh yeah. That, that you got to be there. Like if, you're, our, if you're, if you're on time, you're late. If you're yeah. early, you're on time. Correct. We always had, we called it, we called it golden flash time. Like you're supposed to be there 15, 15 minutes early was our, 15 minutes early was our time cut off. You had to be there 15 minutes early. So, so we called it John Brown time. And because Jim Clemens used to say, I'll be John Brown for everything. He would say, I'll be John Brown. It's kind of like uh, Denzel in the movie. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. John, that was his saying John. So Someone would say, hey, what time is it? Do you mean real time or John Brown time? Because he made you set your watches 15 minutes early. And, you know, you, you had to be every, everywhere you go, you had to be there 15 minutes early. That was his rule. So you guys, you had a name for it. We all, we had a name for it as well. 15 minutes. And it's, it's a wonderful life lesson because, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're in, if you're in the habit of being somewhere early, your own time. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, there's, there's, I, there's, there's value in it, but sometimes you wonder, especially <laughs> as an 18 or 19 year old kid, you're like, yeah. just tell me to be here 15 minutes early. Like what's yeah. the, why do why tell me to be here at two when you really want me here at one forty five? It doesn't make any sense. Just uh, tell because, me what you want. Because you know, an 18 year old is not going to listen and follow Correct. directions. Correct. And they're going to do their own thing. So I'm going to make you run regardless. Now I just give you a reason for it. <laughs> That's really that, that's that mind game. But I mean, when you really think about, you know, as an adult, all the things you, you've learned through sports that you can still apply. And it, it's, I mean, it's, I, I love sports for that reason. And I, you know, even mentioned that, um, there are companies that hire people that play sports in college because you've been, you, you know, you, you know how to get along with other people. And sometimes you don't like those people. You still have to get along with them. You, you understand what it's like to have to push through something that's difficult. You understand that you have to rely on other people to be successful. And no matter how much you want to do it yourself, you, you need other people. And you will, you learn that, you know what? It's tough, but I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And as, as an athlete, those, those lessons are, you know, often more valuable than anything you've learned in the classroom because they're, they're applicable to everything you do in life. You know, it's, you you teach your kids how to work hard. You teach your kids, you know, to, you know, not just have manners, but how to, to overcome things that they may not understand, but eventually they see it and you just, you you know, the lessons are, are, are just, so valuable they really are and i think that sometimes you have to fight through a lot to see them and when you see them retrospectively it's a lot easier to understand them sometimes than you understand them in the moment when you're going through again some of the bipolar coaching and some of the different things that you have to kind of get through in order to get there and i think going back to just that adjustment going from high school to college, you find out pretty quickly that it's a different sort of approach. It's a different sort of mentality. And I think there's there's clearly pressure because for the first time, you're competing with guys on your own team who are of a similar level, level of talent and right. ability to you. Whereas, obviously, as a high school player, you're clearly, if you're playing Division One college basketball, you're clearly one of the best players, I mean, certainly on your own team. No um, question. And then you go and now you're competing with other guys who are equal to you. And so you can't, again, you just, you just have to, you have to be ready to compete every single day 
or it's very easy to look bad very quickly. Oh my valley. goodness. You know, it's, it's so funny, you know, you think, all right, you know, we're division one athletes and you know, the majority of our teammates were first, second or third team, all Ohio or all Michigan or all Pennsylvania or whatever. And then you realize, wait a minute, we're not even talking about Cincinnati or Xavier or Ohio State. We're just right. we're just talking about you know what we refer to as mid majors. Yep. But when you're looking at these players, were the best players on their team, and they <laughs> they're you know some of them aren't getting playing time at all. I, I was just recently with Andre Brown, one of my Youngstown teammates, and he. He reminded me, and I had, didn't even realize this. You know, you're talking about not getting playing time as a freshman. You know, we were talking about, he says, I didn't even travel most road games. And I'm like, I didn't even know that. And it's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to start as a freshman and I, you know, I started every game I played, but it's, it's, it was so naive of me to think, wait a minute, I have teammates who don't even travel the road games and not know that. <laughs> don't you take that for granted, though, when you think back? Like, I look at my experience, and I experienced as a freshman not playing, so I kind of knew what that was like. But then my sophomore, junior, and senior year, I started every game. I think I averaged like 37 minutes a game. Like, I never came off the floor. Yeah. And you look at that, and you're like, I mean – Yet going through the practices and the grind of it was still tough for me. And I knew at that point, like, man, I'm like, I'm going to play. I mean, I'm going to get to play a lot. And yet, to your point, there's guys that are going through the same thing I'm going through. And then Saturday comes and all they get to do is put on their uniform and go sit at the end of the bench. And I remember what that was like, but I didn't, I didn't look at those guys in the same way once I was playing. I, I didn't see them through that lens. I, I just, I was just doing my thing. So there's, there's two parts of that. I just thought about one is those guys were all Ohio, right? Exactly. Great. And players. they're not even, and they're not even playing on a team. That's not really that good. So it's, I mean, there's a perspective for you. It's okay. Here I am, you know, third team, all Ohio, and I'm I'm starting, I'm playing, and then you have a guy who's second team all Ohio, and he's not even traveling on a road games. Wow, that's interesting to me. And then, but the other part of that is, you know, you you really understand how much work it takes, and that's the part that I, you know, again for me, what the book is. You know, the majority of the people tell their stories about what they had to do to get to that next level. You know, I, again, I look at, okay, so yeah, Eric Snow, who we grew up in the same neighborhood, went to the same elementary, same middle school, same high school. He's a few years younger than me. But, you know, his story was fascinating to me because he was always a really good athlete. You know, he was he was a great football player. He was a very good basketball player, you know, and literally he was a really good baseball player. Um, you know, his brother was a professional football player. So, you know, they, ha they have that in their genes, but listening to him talk about what it took to get to the next level, you know, number one, you can't be stagnant. You can't be content with just being, you know, wherever you are, you, you know, your goal hopefully is I want to be even better or I want to get to the next level, whatever that goal is. So to listen to him to say, okay, I've always worked, but now, you know, Michael Resper, guard at Michigan State, you know, showed him what that work really looked like. So, you know, there are so many athletes who talk about finding someone to show them what that, what that, what work really looks like. Cause you think you're working hard and you, you know, you're putting in quality time, quality minutes and, you know, before practice, after practice. Now, what's that extra drive? What's that look like? And, you know, I, I was telling the kids at McKinley the story about Kobe, Kobe Bryant, you know, would show up hours before school. Like, oh man, I never did that. 
you know, I was a pretty good player. Imagine if I would have put in, you know, two hours every morning before school and then have school, you know, practice after school. And then I'm going to go put in two more hours of work. You know, I didn't have that mentality in high school. You know, I, I played a lot of basketball and I know, you know, at that time we didn't have club ball. We didn't have AAU, but we did a lot of travel basketball. We played a lot of summer league. We played a lot of basketball, but you know, that, that individual, you know, I, I tell people, you know, success is what you're doing when nobody's looking. That's the, the true mark of how good are, how much work are you willing to do? And it's usually the time when nobody's watching you, when no one's looking, all right, what, what work are you putting in? What are you working on? You know, I spent a lot of time, you know, as a post player, you know, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time ball handling. I didn't spend a lot of time, you know, we didn't have the three point shot at the high school at the time. So I, you know, back was always to the basket, working on jump hook, working on up and unders, working on, you know, everything, triple threat and move to the basket. But I didn't spend a lot of time on other parts of my game. I learned those things in college. But, you know, if, if, if you learn those things earlier, how much better would you be? You know, that's the question I always pose to myself and to others is like, yeah, I was a pretty good player. So imagine if I would have put even more work in, you know, the, the thing that makes great players great is that separation of how much time they're not put, you know, we always thought, oh, that guy's so lucky to be good, or he's so lucky to be tall. Well, we don't see what he's doing when, when he's away, you know, how much work is he putting in? That's, that's what's separating, you know, the, the, the really good players from the really great players. Yeah, there's no doubt that time that you put in, I, I look at, I hear stories of guys, you know, in the college game today and you know they're going up and they're getting shots at 11 o'clock at night or it's during the season they're coming in for a half hour of skill work before practice and I can honestly say like at least at Kent at that time like the culture was not like we didn't show up like I said I heard the Dick Van Dyke theme song and that's when I headed out to practice yeah, exactly and we weren't we weren't on the pra- I was not on the practice floor getting shots up before practice and I wasn't really doing it after practice and I wasn't doing it on off days because I was tired. In all honesty, you talked about you talked about how just physically exhausting it is, and you just I, you, I it was almost like the rest and recovery. I, I'd be interested. Just you think about how Division One basketball has changed. They just basketball in general. I mean, I think I'm sure for you it was the same. Like it was in in the preseason. It was no. We would practice three three and a half hours in the preseason. And then even during the season, let's say we played Wednesday, Saturday, we'd practice for two and a half hours on Wednesday going super hard. And then we'd go quote unquote easy on Friday. And it would be, you know, it'd be an hour and a half of, you know, they'd be killing you. And you think now with all the, what we know today in terms of just having players recover and the number of coaches that we talked to that are like, Hey, we just, you know, we want our guys to be, to be fresh. And there was not, there was not one shred of thought, put into hey we want our guys to be fresh it was just we're we're gonna we're gonna this is what we do and this is how we do it and we're gonna go go hard and grind you into the ground and so the the idea of going and getting up extra shots to me again as a kid who loved basketball and in the off season that's what i was doing but during the season there was no way no, that, no. that was happening <laughs> you know and, and we were also in that era where they were the mindset was still it started to change around that time in the late 80s but it was waters for the week. Right. We don't take water breaks. And then our trainer would come in. Oh, yes, we're going to tra- take water breaks. <laughs> but I, I just, you know, it's funny how you, you just mentioned that, how those walkthroughs the day before the game turned in, you know, it's supposed to be an hour walkthrough, <laughs> walk through. And then it turned into this full blown sprint of practice. It's like, for sure. Coach, I got no legs. But it, they didn't care because. They saw, okay, we're going to work on this, and that walk became became a sprint. There was no; it should have been called a sprint through because yeah. it wasn't a walk through. Yeah, it's yeah, and then it, all it would take is like one guy. You'd be going, we're like, all right, we're going to go three quarter speed, and so you'd be running through something, and then one of your teammates would suddenly blow by you. Yeah, 
And then somebody would get, then they start yelling at you. I'm like, it's, we're going three quarter speed. Like, I'm not really trying to stop this guy. He just is going by me. And then, so then it's like, all right, well, if I'm going to get yelled at, because it's another example of like a mind game, right? It's, yep. Is yes. it is it three quarter speed or are we going all out? So if it's three, <laughs> so if it's three quarter speed, then I, I'm not trying to stay in front of this guy. We're just moving and going through the motions. And if it's full speed, then let me know and we'll go full speed. But it was always you were always trying to figure stuff out that when you look back on it, I don't know. I just always wonder like what's the value? That in, is what's that the is value a, in some of the tactics. That is a mind game I had forgotten about. The walk through the guy who just like, come on, man, you're, you're killing us. Like you want to be, <laughs> right. you, yeah. So so now you want to be Michael Jordan in practice, really, in a walk through. So yeah. you, this is how this is how you're going to earn your playing time. That yeah. that guy who who's number twelve. Who you know, looking back, it's like I understand because right. you're trying to you're trying to get some notice me, coach. I'm working hard. Notice me, but really, is this the right time? That's funny. Yeah. It, it's just, again, like I said, I think you're just, you're just physically tired and it was, it was different. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies. And most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. I look at the way that Division One basketball has changed today, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. But I don't know what it was like at Youngstown, but when our season ended, we would get like a two-page ditto and say, "Hey, here's your off-season workout plan. Oh. We'll see you back here, and we'll see you back here in August." And that was pretty much, pretty much it. Whereas now, those guys are on campus fifty out of the week, fifty weeks out of the year, and they're doing their individual workouts all summer. I personally, on a personal level, to me, I would have, I would have hated that because I wanted to. When the season ended, I wanted to go out and play. I just wanted to go play some pickup. I wanted to work on my game by myself. The idea of having to listen to the same coaching staff yes. all summer would have that would have been. I don't know how guys. I don't know how guys do it. To be honest, I don't know how players do it. But even more, I'm, I don't even know how coaches do it. Like you gotta, that's to me, you got to get away from it. That's, you know, it's funny. I was I was talking to one of the Youngstown assistants uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were just talking. He says, you know, they were they were getting a workout. So this this past team had a pretty successful season. They were in the they were in one of those what was the CBI tournament. I don't even know what CBI stands for, but they played Morgan State. They beat Morgan State, and then they went out and played Fresno State and, and lost. And uh, Fresno State ended up winning. I think they won that whatever that ter- postseason tournament was. And so I go up. Uh, this was this was two weeks ago. So uh, it was Friday the the fifteenth of April. And they're you know everybody's everyone's in the gym. You know coaches aren't quote unquote allowed to watch them, and they're you know the kids are. You know, they worked with the strength and conditioning coach and then they, you know, they were actually playing pickup basketball and their season had ended less than a little less than a month ago. And they were just so hungry to continue. And all I'm thinking is I couldn't wait to spring break to just get away from basketball. You know, I, you probably, we probably what took a, a good month off. Where we didn't do, you know, we may have went and played a pickup game or two, but it wasn't, you know, you weren't doing team activity. Yeah, you You definitely weren't doing anything with your team. I mean, you were not, you were not in the gym. I don't even know. You probably didn't even want to see your teammates for at least three weeks. (laughs) 
He's like, yeah, guys, I love you, but yeah, let's take a break. I just wanted to go play, to be honest with you. I just wanted to go play and be able to play freely without someone – there you, that was there, the you that was, that was there you my, go. That was that was always my mentality when the season ended. Was I wasn't necessarily sick of basketball. Oh, but, I was sick of basketball. But I was I was sick more of just like I wanted to just go out and and play. Um, so you heard Coach McDonald's voice in your sleep? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, abs- absolutely. You can still. Um, you know, I mean, again, like we talked about earlier, I mean, I can still hear his, <laughs> you know, some of his sayings, like one of his favorite sayings was it's, that's not a lead pipe cinch. So I can, I mean, I could apply that to a bazillion different scenarios where he would, you know, use that particular, that particular phrasing. And yeah, you just, you look back, you look back on it and you, you, you go through and you see some of those experiences and, and you wonder, like I said, what, like what the thought process was of. Like how's this? How's this supposed to be helping us? And I, I, I don't. I still to this day some of the things I don't. I don't. Some of those things I still. I still don't know the answer. As you'll a, never. As a you'll 52 never year know. old guy, I'll never. I'll never figure it out. You'll so, never know. But it's definitely. I mean, again, it's it's an experience that I wouldn't trade. Uh, I'm certainly glad that I had the opportunity, and and I was a kid that you know I was I was lucky. Uh, to to end up with a with the Division One scholarship, I was definitely player number seven in a seven man class without question, and uh, you know there were a lot of people I don't think that that thought that I could do what I ended up being able to do in my college career, and there are probably a lot of places I would have gone where I wouldn't have been able to do that, and I'm thankful for Coach McDonald every single day because I think I was the type of player that he liked, and as a result of that, it got me on the floor and, and once I had an opportunity on the floor I was able to do some things that enabled me to to stay out there and so I wouldn't I wouldn't trade that for the world but there's a lot of there's a lot of definitely odd and strange things that you look back on you're like man that was do that you, was quite an experience are you familiar with the um, the percentage of high school players who played division one basketball yeah it's like one like 1. 1.9 1. Yeah, or 1. Yeah. 1.7 something somewhere, like that somewhere in there yep Yep. And then six percent total. Is that correct? Is that accurate? That sounds, that sounds about. That sounds about right. Yeah, as far as playing college basketball, I think that speaks to what you talked about before, right? When you said here you have guys who are first, second, or third team all Ohio who aren't even getting off the floor, getting on the floor on a mid-major Division One team that's an a, that's average at best. And I think that's one of the things that when I think about. One of the biggest problems that we have in basketball today is parents and high school players having an understanding of how good you have to be to play college basketball at any level. And we've, we've talked to we've talked to a ton of Division three coaches, and I've kind of become a a big proponent of of trying to promote the Division three game because I think. People just have no idea how good those players are, and I think if if more parents and more players would sit down and go and watch a Division three game, they would have a completely different perspective on sort of what the reality is for their situation. Because people just they have no idea how good you have to be to be able to play college basketball. They have none at any level. Yeah, you, exactly. you are. Yeah, and one of the people that I was fortunate enough to interview is was the athletic director at a, a division two school in North Carolina, uh, Queens college, which is in Charlotte. Coach and Lundy just coach Lundy just left there. Oh, wow. Um, he went to, uh, he's at, he's at Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He's actually coming on the podcast next. He's going to be our guest next week. I interviewed, I met him when I went down and worked at Jay Billis's camp a couple of years ago. And he was really successful. He actually was had two stints at Queens, uh, but he just wrapped up his last one, and then he went to he went to UW Milwaukee. Just they're the, like a they're the Panthers, right? There. Yes, yes, UW Milwaukee. Huh? Yeah, we yep. were. Yep. Yeah, we play. Uh, well, actually, they're they're in the same conference as Youngstown currently, but. Yeah, who knows what the con- even even on the college level, it's like the conferences are I, like like who's where, what you're yeah, playing against uh, this school. It's crazy. But um, you know the the point that she made, the athletic director, is that the uh, Vision Two is pretty much the best fit for the majority of athletes. 
and, you know, it's you know obviously if you division one, division two, II, division three, not NAI or JUCO, but it's it's kind of the middle of the road. And you know one of the things I kind of point out in the book is that um, just because you're playing division two, it's not a it's not a failure. If or even division three, you know we always look. I think we we being athletes look at well if you're not playing division one then you failed. And I think that mindset has to change. It has to change because number one, every in, if everyone is going to play who can play, um, that 1.7% chance of playing division one, that means you have to go somewhere else. But the reality is, you know, division two and division three, they just have so much more fun. It's just, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's totally different. I agree. It's completely it's, different. You know, if, and, and I would tell any athlete, if, if, if you want a quality education, go to division three. If you want a guaranteed job when you graduate from a quality institution, division three is your level. If you want, good basketball and a very good institution and maybe get a little bit of scholarship money. Division two is for you. And, you know, you may, you may or may not get everything paid for, but again, quoting Ron Strollo, the athletic director at Youngstown, you're, you have a better chance of getting an academic scholarship than you do an athletic scholarship. So make sure your grades are good because your chances of getting a scholarship for athletics are slim to none when you look at it as a as a as a nation your chance of getting an academic scholarship is completely up to you so if you if you, if you have the grades and you have the ability to just go out and just enjoy playing sports and not have the pressure oh division two division three that's where it's at and it's the right it's about finding the right fit i mean i think that correct that's something that when if you if your mentality is division one or nothing, and I'll be honest with you, that was my mentality. That's all I knew. So I was the <laughs> right. same. That's yeah. all I knew. Yeah, I remember. So I grew up. My dad was a professor at Cleveland State, and I remember being, you know, whatever fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and my dad said, "Hey, you know, maybe someday you'll, you know, maybe someday you'll be able to play for Cleveland State." I remember being like, you know, what, are you, "What are you talking about? Like, I'm gonna." I want to go play at Cleveland State. All right? I'm like you're crazy. You know, I'll be at I'll be at North Carolina or Ohio State. What are you talking about? And you again, you just have no idea. And back then, there wasn't there wasn't information out there. Like it was impossible to find information about what where you were and who who was recruiting you. And you get one letter, and you're like, oh man, I must be you know I'm ready to go. And nowadays, I think it's it's so much easier to be well informed. Although I don't think people take advantage of the information that's out there to understand the different opportunities. But really, again, what you want to do is find the right fit. And unfortunately, right. you look at the transfer portal and there's so many kids that are just, hey, I go here and then, well, I know I got a mulligan. I can go somewhere else and you know, jump into the transfer portal and go play at a different school. And I, I being a college coach today with that going on, to me, is just – that's. A whole other layer. Yeah. Well, and again, going back to the young sound coach, he will, the conversation about that is he is constantly having to recruit, recruit the players that he currently has. Correct. And that's, it's like, that has to be tough where, yeah, you, you know, you're not getting the playing time or you're not happy. All right. Now I'm, I'm going somewhere else. And, but, once you go in the portal, and I, I don't, I don't have a ton of knowledge about the portal. I'm not an expert in any sense of the portal, but it seems to me that there's a lot of kids losing out, you know, and number one, well, number one, high school kids are losing out because right. you're, you're adding an extra year for everyone. And you're also allowing kids to transfer. And then there's a ton of D2 and D3 kids who are transferring to D1. So that means the few spots that are available are, are, are even less now 
So that's a, that's a tough spot to be in. And you're a kid coming out of high school and, you know, you, you the, each team used to have, you know, pretty much a guaranteed two, three, four spots open, if if not more. But now you have players, well, I'm going to stay for an extra year. Okay, well, that's a spot that we lost. And right. then you have another kid who says, well, I'm going to transfer to that school. Well, there's another spot you lost. That's That's tough. It's really tough. And I think look at your own situation. If you go back and here you are, you go to Youngstown, you're a starter as a freshman, you're putting up good numbers. Maybe you stay after your freshman year. Now after your sophomore year, suddenly you're looking around and going, hey, man. I think I'm good enough. I can go play. Maybe I can go play at a Big Ten school. And yeah. if you're if you're a Big Ten school, you're like, hey, we could recruit Tim Jackson out of the portal, who just got done averaging 14 points a game and 11 rebounds as a sophomore. He's already adjusted to college life. We know he's going to be able to hack it academically. He's already been through two seasons of practice. Why do we want to take a chance on some high school kid when? We can get a guy who's already adjusted. And you can see how and why the portal could potentially be a good thing. But as a coach, it's just like if you're a mid-major and you develop guys, the benefit is, right, over the course of four years, maybe you get a guy who is under the radar or late developing. And now you develop that kid over four years. And by the time he's a senior, man, you've got something. And now you've got – the potential of having a really good team. Well, now that kid's going to leave. I mean, he's going to go. Chances are, once he starts to really develop, he's going to look around and go, hey, I could go and play at this higher level. And it's just it just creates so many more, I think, challenges. And I understand the reason why they did it, because previously only co- when, when a coach could leave and get this half a million dollar buyout and then go and immediately be coaching, and then all the players are kind of left stuck, and you get it. But it's just created this whole world that is – it's it's a challenge on a lot of fronts. I think it's it's a challenge for coaches. But as you said, it's not necessarily good for players. And I'm sure there are some players that benefit from it. But I think a lot of players are just chasing a carrot that they can never, ever catch. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's And it's – I don't know when it's going to get corrected or how long it's going to take. But you figure at least – three or four years before it corrects. And and typically, whenever you have a pendulum in college athletics, it swings in the opposite direction, obviously, and it, it's going to get worse. So I'm hoping that it that doesn't happen where it overcorrects, you know, as most things do, and then you, you – then what? Yeah, so I, I can't I I can imagine what that would look like. I don't know what the end game is. And then, yeah. you know, you throw in the NIL stuff and that just is a whole other thing that you have. I mean, that basically that, you know, a lot of colleges are creating just a position of a player, of you know, a person to deal with, just to deal with that and help coaches and athletes navigate that whole piece of it. So it's, there's certainly a lot of things that are, that are different from the days when you and I played in terms of that, just the off season stuff, the NIL, the, the transfer portal, things that weren't in place then that college athletes have to deal with that are on top of all the things that, that you and I went through back in our time. Right. Yeah. Who's who's the most inter- interesting person you interviewed for the book? Oh, man. They're, I'm, that's a great question. Um, so, well, let me start with the fact there are two professional athletes that that it's, it's pretty interesting just the fact that they're professional athletes. Uh, Derek Kennard, who is, uh, who won a Super Bowl with the Cowboys. Um, and he, his son is currently an NFL player as well. So that was pretty fun. Just the fact that you get that NFL perspective and the, the parent perspective of as an NFL player. And then, uh, there's a gentleman who I spoke with as a parent. Um, oh my goodness. Why is my mind just completely escaping me? Um, Todd Heap. Oh, excuse me, not Todd Heap. Todd, uh, oh my goodness. Todd Pete. Todd Pete. I apologize for that. Well, Todd played NFL. He has a son who plays currently. No, he's retired now in the NFL. But he had four kids who were Division One athletes. Uh, and do, a daughter who played basketball. So just listening to 
you know, the advice of a parent, because again, you know, you, you're hearing as a coach, you know, and being around the game, you hear these parents, oh, my son's going to be a division one player or my son's going to go to the school. Well, listening to parents who, who put their kids through that and then having other siblings not get to that level. It's fascinating to hear the mentality of a parent who's gone through it. Um, the best story for me is a gentleman who played football at South Carolina State. And the story is fascinating because he's, he's from um, Newark, New Jersey. He decides to go to South Carolina State. And in the, the mid-1980s, um, just dealing with the racism um, of the South. But the story that really caught my eye was, you know, he's telling the story about how, what they normally do for their road trips. They always, you know, go through the airport shirt, suit and tie there and just looking good. But he said this particular coach told them to put on their sweats. They didn't get to walk through the airport. They got on the plane from the, on the runway. They, get to their playing Gremlin. So they get to, uh, they fly into Louisiana. They're, pra they practice in their hotel and he has, you know, he's just like, this is just nuts. What's going on? So they, they play the game. They're ushered out of the arena. They get these bag lunches. And he's, you know, the one thing he just mentions is that, Every game, especially when they win, they get this steak dinner. And he's so much looking forward to the steak dinner. So they get on the plane. And again, they you know, put your sweats on, get on the plane. And they're flying back to, uh, to, to South Carolina. Coach says, thank you because you handle all this adversity that you're not used to. And they're like, what's going on? Well, there was a bomb threat to both teams because it was like the first time that you had two black colleges playing on ESPN. So both teams had bomb threats. And I'm, this is 1985. And I, it, it, it shocked me because, you know, I, I just can't imagine having to, to, to go through that process. Um, but all this, the, it's really, it's a book of stories and each story is, it, it goes beyond just, well, you have to work hard and you have to learn how to manage your time. It's, you know, what players went through either to get to college, to stay in college or survive, or, you know, there's players who quit and, you know, I told their story, the players who decided because of injuries, you know what, I'm going to just play, um, intramurals. Um, and then, or club sports, um, what, what it's like to deal with Ivy league schools, what's it like to deal with military schools. Um, the one thing I tried to do was not make this about one particular sport or one particular gender. And it was fun because I got to talk to, I think I did 39 actual athletes that I, that I sent questionnaires out and interviewed. And then another 15 coaches, you know, at all different levels. But the only, the, the, the sport that I could not get anyone to talk to me, hockey. Hockey, really? player, wow. hockey players did not return my calls, didn't reach out, didn't, you know, I'd call coaches, I would call players, um, email. I got no response from hockey players. So I guess they... They are, they're a different breed. Doing their own thing. Doing their own thing. But, um, you know, I wanted to, you know, football, baseball, basketball, volleyball, gymnastics, soccer, women's, you know, swimming. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you this, my, the, the thing that was the biggest eye opener, I spoke to a gentleman who was at uh, Washington State and he was in charge of, um, wellness, basically mental, you know, mental wellness. So I, I said, what sport do you 
deal with the athletes the most? Do you have sleepless nights or do you worry? And I'm, I'm thinking he's going to say, you know, football or track and swimming. And, you know, my follow-up question, why? Well, they're time sports. They're competing against themselves. In their, they're in their head. And all they have is time to think. And you know what that means. When you just have you and your thoughts, anything can happen. You're opening yourself to a whole different world. And, you know, basketball, you're, you're rarely ever alone. You know, there's... You may have that one time when you have that breakaway where you're alone, you know, all the other nine players are at half court. That's that's your only – or you're shooting a technical free throw. That's your only alone time. So imagine being a track athlete or a swimmer where, you know, if you're a miler and all you have are your thoughts and you're trying to beat a time. So that was an eye-opener for me. That's interesting. Every day you're being measured. And if you're not going faster than you did the day before, it's right there in front of you. Whereas in a sport like basketball or soccer or football, you can still delude yourself. I have a better way of saying it. Yeah, that's, that you're, that's it. That you're getting better or that, hey, I had a good practice today or maybe I didn't play as well. But oh, come on, it wasn't that bad. Whereas when you put a time on it, right, you know yeah. exactly. Or unless you're like Coach Clemens, you just make up the time, right? You, <laughs> you just there. make it up. You're just, exactly. you're, you're just standing on the side yeah. of the pool going, yeah, you were yeah. nine-tenths of a second like slower, slower today. <laughs> like, can you prove it? <laughs> but no, it, it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the other portion of this book that, you know, my takeaway is the, the players who – Played, you know, not the not the current athletes, but the ones who were who were removed. It was not just nostalgic. It was what's the word I'm looking for? It was um, healing. You know, it, it there were a lot of scars that were able to to finally. Uh, Did they look back on it with regret? I mean, no. They, so they I think they all looked back on it with. With appreciation. And that, that was a surprise because I was expecting a lot of regret. I was expecting, you know, the, oh, I wish I would have. Yeah. You know, the whole purpose of this book was, is what are the things you wish you would have known? What are all the things you wish someone had told you? That's the, you know, that's the overall theme. You know, all the things that high school athletes, Man, if I was in high school, if I would have known this, okay, I would have been better. There's no question. But the 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 thing that I learned from talking to the former athletes was there was so much more appreciation. You know, you look back, it it's there's a, there's my favorite quote. There is a swimmer. Embrace the suck. Yeah. And I was like, wow. You know, it's yeah, it's going to suck. Deal with it. Just take it. Embrace it. Make enjoy it. Because it's not gonna not every moment's gonna be fun. Not everything is gonna be enjoyable. It's you know, it's kinda like when you're when you're doing those sprints, you know it's not gonna last forever. Find a way to get through it. And once when you're done, you're like, Okay, I I made it, it's over. I'm a better person. But no, uh, the, I, 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 the, the two things I like about this book, and, and I'm saying this not because I'm the author, but I'm saying that because it's, I, I really think it's a quality book. It's a, it's a necessary book. The one, the first thing is, if you're not an athlete, I think the stories can still speak to you. I think the story, you know, there's, there's some compelling stories that give the life advice. You know, again, athletics is probably one of the best, um, you know, modes of, of learning how to be a better person. And then for those people who are athletes, it's, you know, everything that's going to make you better. So I, you know, everyone who I'm talking to now is saying, where was this when I was an athlete? Where was this when I was in high school? Somebody should have written this story. Somebody should have told me all these stories. And I, I think it's pretty cool because I think it's going to transcend time. It's not going to be, 
you know, like, you know, stories of NIL or stories of, you know, COVID where, okay, it's over. Now what? I think, you know, these stories are, you know, they're going to be generational. They're, it's no matter what era you play, what sport you play, what gender, what division, what level, there's something that I think everyone can take away. Well, you're hearing that, right? As you're sitting there and you're conducting these interviews and you're talking to people, you're you're seeing and hearing what they're saying through the lens of your experience. And it sounds like from our conversation tonight that a lot of the conversations that you had, you were able to recognize those same things in yeah. your experiences. And that's what I think when you talk about it being timeless – Again, you and I in our 50s, guys that played college basketball a long time, I mean, a lifetime ago at this yes. point. And, and yet, the, the feeling that you and I share and the feeling that some of the, the athletes and coaches and people that you talk to, those feelings are still, are still there. and They're still raw and they're still similar. Now, the stories are slightly different, but the overall themes of – what it's like to be a college athlete are pretty similar to exactly. what it was like 35, 40 years ago. I mean, yeah. Just, and that's it amazing. Is. It is. It is amazing. It is amazing. There's, you know, I mean, there's, there aren't that many changes. There's, there may be a change in how they do things. There may be a change in, you know, uh, the, what the work week actually looks like, you know, in terms of how many hours you can spend, you know, those things have changed and, what, you know, how much time you can spend with your head coach, how much time you can spend with the strength and conditioning coach. Those things have changed, but the overall how to get through it overall, what you have to do to survive the, you know, the, the, the timing, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. That's, I think that's always going to be there, you know, learning how to, to wind down your day. And I, I had a really great conversation with uh, one of my old teammates, Bill Robinson. And, you know, he was telling me when he got to Ohio State, you know, he was a, you know, very smart kid in high school, very smart kid. You know, he's teaching in Canton City Schools now. But he was telling me they basically just threw a bunch of athletes into a study hall with no direction. And they couldn't figure out, like, why his grades weren't as good as they were when he was in high school. Well, there was no help. So, oh, well, we have academic advisors. Well, you want to help me out with my schedule? You want to tell me, you know, <laughs> give me give me some direction here? So, you know, that was, you know, 35 years ago. So now... You know, talking to uh, the uh, academic advisor at Youngstown, they have a better idea of, you know, students coming in, what their needs are. They're paying more attention to um, the details of not just their, their ACT and SAT scores, but specifically what do they need. And, they're, you know, they're doing a better job of aptitude, of figuring out, okay, this kid wants this degree, but that's not where they should be headed because they don't even like that field. But getting a getting a better sense of what kids need and what kids want and you know how how to make better use of their time, how to make better connections. So I think those things have changed because they've gotten better and you're not you you're no longer on an island. Cuz there's so many you know students and I'm sure there's still students who feel like they're on an island now. But I think it's better. There's so definitely I, more. There's definitely more support, right? I mean, you talk yeah. about, you think about like from a nutrition standpoint. Oh, my, a, yeah, yeah. Or from a from a sports psychology point of view, and people help being there to help with mental health. I mean, I think about nutrition. Like at Kent, we would eat Coach McDonald. We ate steak every pregame meal. Oh my god, steak, so chick we, steak or chicken or pasta. Yeah, you know, I mean, and that's just the way. That's the way it was, and there was no. Yeah, like I never, I never once had a conversation with anyone about nutrition or what I ate. I've told this story a couple of times on the pod, Tim, but we, after those Saturday practices that I mentioned in the preseason, those would be like from 7 to like 10 a.m. or 7 to 10.30 a.m. on a Saturday. And then we would have Sunday off. 
So basically you finished at 10, 1030 on Saturday, then you didn't have to come back to practice until whatever Monday at 330. And we would go directly from those practices. Uh, we would go right to the buffet at Ponderosa yeah, yep. and just sit down and I'd be at the soda machine and I'd have the steak and the chicken wings and the the pot, you know, the pasta that had all the grease on it. You know, you're just thinking, I mean, we'd sit in there for like three, three hours and just, uh, I'm sure Ponderosa, we probably helped the place go bankrupt eventually. But, you know, and it, but you think about that from a nutrition standpoint and, you know, nobody, uh, there, was ne- there was never a conversation about, hey, what are you, you know, and again, it wasn't like I was somebody that was eating terrible or whatever, but I wasn't, I, I was not focused at all on nutrition. It just, there, it wasn't there. Whereas now, no. you know, again, you, people are monitoring that stuff and they're keeping, you know, like we talked about earlier, they're keeping an eye on, you know, what's the workload on, on the on these guys and do we need to dial it back and all that stuff is it's got to be. It's got to be better for the athlete in that in those terms. The 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 sleep, yeah. The 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 diet, the mental. It's 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 so much better now. Yeah, we sleep. I didn't even know what that was. Like I'll sleep. I'll sleep eventually. Right. But uh, you, you know, normally in the afternoon. But you know, I think now it's it's. You have to take it into account, and it's t- actually I will say this: it's taken into account. Just it is, talking yeah. to I agree. you know, um, pretty much everyone on campus, every support staff member that I talk to, they talk about you know mental health, eating, sleeping, you know, making sure that that they're okay. And I think that was you know there there is a there is a portion of the book dedicated to to the mental portion of what, you know, what athletes went through and what they're doing now to make it so much better. And you, have to be able, you have to be able to have conversations. Right. And, you know, we didn't have those conversations at all. It wasn't, you know, it was, you know, obviously society's changed because we've gotten to the point where, you know, we can, we can talk about wanting and needing um, help. Whereas before, it's like that was a sign of weakness. You didn't you didn't talk about those things. So, you know, when we say some things haven't changed, well, fortunately, those things have. And you know, it's it's still up to the to the athlete to to get the help that they need. But at least now, you know, more athletes will be aware that those services exist and that it is okay to ask for help. Yeah, just having those avenues available is something, like you said, that was not there. It was not in place back when you and I were playing college basketball. It just was not – it was not there at all. All right, I want you to boil down a couple of key lessons by answering this question. So let's say that a high school basketball player and their parent comes to you and says, Tim – Love your book. We're thinking about the opportunity that we may have to play Division One college basketball at some point. What are one or two of the most important things that we should know going in that we might not know as a high school athlete and a parent? So what are the one or two biggest lessons, takeaways that – you learned or that you clarified for yourself in the course of doing the book? Well, let me start by saying you know, the book itself is not going to guarantee anyone getting a scholarship to any level. <laughs> it, that by no means is the point of the book. I, I want to make that very clear. Uh, the point of the book is to for the people who are going to play all the things that you need to know to be prepared. So, I would, but I would answer that question by saying, um, make sure you're having conversations with coaches. You know, we have this thing where we only listen to people who agree with us or who feel the same way. So if, you know, we have so many players who, hey, my coach isn't helping me get to college. Well, let me ask you this question. Are you putting in the work? Are you, constantly working on your craft to get better 
well, I'm not spending as much time as, you know, so-and-so. Well, okay, there's your first, you know, let's make sure that you're handling your business academically, athletically, you know, mentally, emotionally. Um, the second portion of that is, you know, are, are the people that you're talking to honest with you? You know, if, if, if you ask your college coach, Hey coach, do you think I'm a division one prospect? And he says, yes. Then that follow up should be asking another coach, asking people who are currently playing, Hey, do you think I'm good enough to play division one basketball? And, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough that when I was in high school as a sophomore and even as a junior, I played college level summer league. So I was playing with college players and with grown men. So, I mean, I knew, okay, I can, I can take the physical part. I know I'm good enough to play. You know, if I'm good enough to play with Anthony Robinson, who's playing at Bowling Green, if I'm good enough to play with Gary Grant, I think I, I think I can play at the college level. So, you know, I, I would start with, are you playing against players who play in college? And if you're not, well, you need to be playing because that's your true measure. You know, if you're, if you're playing against players that you're better than, and those are the only players you're playing against, and that's your measurement. Oh, yeah, I'm good because I'm beating all the players at my high school. Well, if they're not division one level, you you really don't know your 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 skill set. You know you don't know how good you really are unless you're playing against the best. And then the next level up is: Are you playing against college athletes? Did that answer your question? It did. It okay. Did, it did 100. <laughs> percent I think I think it's a great point. I think it's interesting that when you talk about the opportunity to play against college level players and playing against players who are older than you. It's, it's something that the system today doesn't allow for very much because yeah. kids are always playing against other kids their same age. They're usually playing with a ref. They're usually playing with parents sitting in the stands. They're usually playing with a scoreboard. And they don't get those same opportunities that you and I got to go play pickup. You know, like I said, my dad was a professor at Cleveland State, so I could go down when I was 15, 16, 17 and try to sneak my way into a game with college players. Or I could be up at the – playground and play with adults and play with guys who were you know when i was in when i was in eighth or ninth grade playing with high school players playing with college players playing with adults and i think that that's something that kids today they miss they miss out on mike i i've I've had a great chance to listen to some of the podcasts i haven't you know and they've been amazing thank you one one of the questions have you had a, a show where you talk about the difference between the players now who are constantly being coached and trained versus when we grew up, we weren't, you, you had to freelance. You had to, I mean, we created, we made up games. Right. And I think we were, we were so much more flexible and we were just so much more fluid because I, we weren't looking over, okay, coach, what do I do next? Right. What do I do now? What's next? We would just make things up because we didn't have that. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for having trainers. and There's something to be said for having coaches. But when you always play for a coach, I feel like you're always looking for validation or you're always looking for, um, hey, what do I do now? As opposed to when we play, we just, all right, figure it out. Well, how much did you play in front of your parents when you were a kid? I, my parents, my parents, if they came to games at McKinley, I was surprised. <laughs> it was, it was, it was wonderful to see them at games at at Youngstown. But I, man, I, I know they never came to junior high games. I, I know that they didn't show up at the playground. No, no, they were, <laughs> you know, and and they definitely didn't. Um, Tell coach, hey, my son should be playing this much, or my son should be playing this position, or no, no. My da- my both my mom and my dad were figured out people. <laughs> you gonna play? You're not playing, or you want to play more? Figure it out. It's just totally, yeah. It's totally, it's totally different. It's totally different, and we haven't. I mean, that topic has come up 
in lots of the different podcasts that we've talked about where it's one it's it's a one question sort of answer with a with a coach or talking about the difference in the system and what I, what I've always said and this is my own personal feeling on it is that I feel like if you look at players today and you look at the 12th man on a high school team the 12th man on a high school team today is way way more skilled than the 12th man on a high school team when you and I were playing. Correct. You see very, very few 6'2", 230-pound football players at the end of a basketball bench today, whereas when we were playing, almost every school had one or two of those guys that had no discernible basketball skill, but they were good athletes, and they could go in there and rough somebody up or set some screens or grab some rebounds, whatever. Whereas now – the twelfth man on your high school team has got every single move in the book. They can go between their legs. They can probably shoot it. They have a lot of skill, especially when you put them in a gym by themselves and throw right. some cones down. They right. look tremendous. <laughs> but, airport airport yeah, players. It is, exactly. They look great in the airport. Exactly. But when you put them out there on the floor with nine other guys, it doesn't look the same. I don't think that the basketball IQ is quite the same. And I also think that there's a level of competitiveness that, again, and this is not it, – it's, it's a blanket statement, but obviously, right. there, it, it, obviously, obviously there are anomalies to this. There are right. kids who are just as competitive as right. anybody from our era. There are kids who are, have just as high of a basketball IQ as anybody did. And, and in general, the level of play – in college basketball and high school basketball is probably higher than it was when you and our kids just for the, for the evolution of the game. Right. But I do think that there's some definite drawbacks to the system today that I'm super glad that I grew up in the era that I did where I got to play, pick up basketball. I got to work on my game too by myself, but I got to go and I got to experience what it was like to play with, older guys, with guys from different neighborhoods, with people all different ages, all different kinds of people and yeah. in different locations and in different gyms and hopping in the car with my friends and be like, all right, where, how are we going to go and find this game or finding some weird gym that there, for some reason, good players showed up there yeah. on Tuesday night at 7 p.m., you knew there were going to be guys in this gym that it was going to be a good run. And kids today, they just don't they don't experience that. And I think I think something something is missing. I don't know what exactly that something is, but I, I'm always glad that I grew up in the era I did. Well, I I can speak for everywhere I've ever lived in the well in the last 15 20 years. I don't see kids on playgrounds. No, I don't see you know I don't see. Um, I'm going to call it unorganized pickup games, unscheduled, un, you know, where you just, oh, their kids are playing basketball. Nobody plays outside. Not, I, no player, let's put it this way, no players at a high level anymore play outside. You can occasionally go and see some ragtag game once in a while, but you never see college level players or good high school players playing outside, at least not anywhere that I go anymore. Yeah, I've, I've, I've not seen it. I've not seen it. I mean, and, and, you know, yes, the quality of gyms are better. Yes. Right. The, the access know, the, is better. The access to the game is better. Yeah, there, there's no question about it. And I, and I even argue that um, at every single level, basketball is more skilled. They're, sure. they're better athletes. Are they better players? We can have that argument all day long. And I, I I don't think they are, but you know, that's just my perspective. You know, I I, I never wanted to be that get off my lawn old guy who, <laughs> you know, who just looks back, well, we played in the best era. Uh, I'm gonna say, I I've had this conversation with several people. I still think in terms of Kent McKinley, the nineteen seventies were the was the era of, of, of McKinley basketball. Um, it's funny. I, I'm the seventh all time leading scorer at McKinley. I am nowhere near. 
I wouldn't even put myself top 50. And I was talking to a guy named Mike Elliott, who's uh, who was one of my basketball coaches. He's a, a Big Ten football official. He's one of my football mentors for officiating. And he played at McKinley in the in the mid to late 70s. And I, I was asking him, I said, no, no one from hardly from the seventies is in the, in the, in scoring. He says, players were so good. You were lucky if you started two years. And, you know, Raymar Morgan is, I think he's number two right now, all time McKinley. He's, he's started four years at McKinley. So we we went from an era, uh, an era of you played two years varsity. You may have started one year. If you were lucky, you started two years. To all right, I started three years. Now you got players starting four years. Yeah, in our era, there was nobody that was playing high school basketball as a freshman. I mean, it was complete. Like my in Strongsville. Uh, we had a junior high. The ninth grade wasn't even in the high school. Yeah, same same with Ken. So, yeah. I I played on the I played on the I played on the ninth grade team. I guess theoretically, theoretically they could have moved you up, but it was also a different time too. Where I feel I talked to my son about this a lot. That I feel like there was more hierarchy in the grades. Like, hey, I'm a senior and I don't talk to juniors. I'm a junior. Right, I don't talk right. to sophomores. Not right. even so much in the basketball sense, but just in the school in general, whereas now I feel like everybody is kind of, everybody knows everybody and it's the, 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 they're all taking the same classes and juniors are in with seniors and it's just the, the grade levels are more fluid. I feel like it makes for, it probably makes for a better team atmosphere, I think, than sometimes when you think about the hierarchy of what it was like when we were playing. Right. I, I just, I just find that fascinating, the fact that you had, you know, you, that how, Basketball's changed, and one of the things that I can I can look at, you know, with analytical data from McKinley is, you had players who were so good. I mean, like, again, Phil Hubbard. Phil Hubbard is probably one of the, you know, one of the greatest players to come out of Northeast Ohio. You know, I put him up there with Clark Kellogg. You know, both of them had great. College careers, knee injuries, you know, knee injuries knee cut injuries. both of them short. Yeah. Yep. You know, Phil was the first freshman to play on an Olympic team. You know, he, he, 1976, you had to be good. But he's not even, he's not, I don't know if he's in the top 15 all time scoring. That's, that's crazy to me. The fact that, well, you know, he developed as a senior, his senior year was amazing, but he, he didn't start as a sophomore. I'm not even sure he played varsity as a sophomore. And here, you know, you can argue he's one of the, you know, greatest players to ever come out of McKinley. And a guy who, in, again, in that era, you just didn't play. It, there were so many great players, you just didn't play. <laughs> you had to wait your time. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And so it, was just, it was just a different. It was a different. It's a, different, it's a different era, different game. No question about that. All right, we have blown past an hour and a half, Tim. So what I want to do is give you a chance before we wrap up to share where people can find the book, where they can buy it, give it one more plug, and then after you do that, I will jump back in and wrap things up. All right, so the book is called Understanding College Athletics Through the Eyes of College Athletes, and currently it is on Amazon.com. So you can uh, Google or go to Amazon.com understanding college athletics through the eyes of college athletes. Um, soon that's going to change. It'll be in other places, but you can get it uh, through Kindle ebook and hard copy or excuse me, soft, well, actual copy, but soft, softback book. So understanding college athlete athletics through the eyes of college athletes currently available on amazon.com. If you get a chance to go out and pick up Tim's book, it is excellent. And you will benefit from it if you are a prospective college athlete or the family of a prospective college athlete. It gives you a lot of things that will help you to understand the lay of the land before you get right into the weeds of college 
athletics, whatever sport it is that you play. Tim, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to jump on with us. It's been a lot of fun to talk with you about the book, but also to kind of reminisce about our similar experiences growing up in the same era of Northeast Ohio basketball. That's been a ton of fun for me. I really appreciate that. And thank you again for your gift of time tonight. It's been a lot of fun having this conversation. It's so funny. We could continue, but we have to go. Hey, I feel like th- we could. I feel yeah, like we could for sure. So. I, I totally appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, open open invite to come back and we'll we'll have to we'll, we, maybe we come back and we do just a a deep dive into uh, into Northeast Ohio basketball from 1985 to 1992 or something like that. It'd be there a lot of fun. Man, All fun. day long. Be, I appreciate it. All right. Thanks to everyone out there for listening. We appreciate it and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.